In November 2022, Pew Research reported a seismic shift in public opinion. It was a stunning poll that the mainstream media completely ignored, but the news should have been welcomed by the Democratic Party as the most hopeful sign for its future. In a dramatic change of perception, the Pew poll revealed that now only 26% of Republicans view corporations positively. Just three years earlier, as many as 54% of the GOP had a favorable view of corporations. But now, the Republican base is no longer aligned with the big business agenda of the party leadership. Feelings towards the financial industry have undergone a similar realignment as well, with 38% of Republicans having a positive view of banks in 2022, as opposed to 63% in 2019. This shocking Pew Research report should have had every Democratic strategist rubbing their hands in glee. Yet the Democratic Party, which traditionally has represented the working class, seemed to have completely brushed off these changes among Republican voters. With growing hatred of corporations, the banks, and the main donor class of the GOP, the Democrats should have an opportunity now to seize a large slice of the Republican base. But it is not just with realigning attitudes towards corporations and banks. The Democratic Party should already be sweeping victories on other policies, because on virtually every major issue, left-wing public policies consistently prove to be vastly more popular than those proposed by the right. Let's rapid-fire some of the other top political issues to see where Democrats should theoretically be making gains amongst Republicans. On climate change, 55% of Republicans believe in taxing corporations based on their carbon emissions. On healthcare, 56% of Republicans want a public option. On taxes, 54% of Republicans want the wealthy to pay a larger share. On labor rights, a whopping 74% of Republicans believe in paid leave. On welfare, more than 50% of Republicans told pollsters that food stamp benefits were too low. And even on hot-button issues such as background checks for guns, a plurality, if not a majority of Republican voters tend to agree with most Democrats. In recent years, we have been fed the narrative from the mainstream media that America has never been more polarized and that this polarization has placed our democracy in peril. Yet it is important to note that the understanding of polarization seen in the press is primarily based on the hostility one group has for the other. When these writers and experts say political polarization, they do not necessarily mean sharp opposing viewpoints on policies. The real question of the day isn't about the supposed polarization of America. Rather, what we should really be asking is, why isn't the American left kicking ass? If the majority in both parties already have strong negative views of the capitalist ruling class, why hasn't the party of working people been able to claim more sweeping electoral victories? The most obvious answer to this question is that the right has more money. Simple as that. The wealthy often tend to be more right-wing than the average person, and when one has a political machine that can buy propaganda, it is easy to convince working people to vote against their own interests. But the inevitability of success based solely on financial resources is contradicted by the number of occasions when the left, or at least center-left liberals, did have more money than the right, yet still managed to lose. In the 2016 presidential election, Hillary Clinton raised more than $200 million than Donald Trump. In other races, such as in the 2018 Texas Senate race, Democrat Beto O'Rourke spent more than $30 million than the eventual winner, Ted Cruz. In the 2022 Ohio Senate race, the Democrat Tim Ryan spent more than 3 to 1 against his Republican opponent and still lost. We can keep going with more examples, but the point is is that money doesn't explain everything. The Democrats are simply not campaigning and organizing as efficiently as the Republicans. There is something wrong with the American left when it is well-resourced, has popular positions, yet still continues to lose. It doesn't have to be this way. Once upon a time, the left did dominate America, even when outspent by the right. There was a period in the early 20th century when liberals, progressives, and even socialists won election after election. The peak for the left came during the New Deal when FDR won four presidential elections in a row. In the wake of this popularity, a successor like LBJ was able to defeat conservative libertarian Barry Goldwater in a massive landslide. There was a time when the left won. It was a time when the left was populist. For this episode, I decided to interview a leading expert on populism, the historian Thomas Frank. 
I was a columnist in the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street I, I was Journal, like, right. I, I, was, I, I was the real deal for, for right. quite a while. When I wrote Listen Liberal, and then when Trump got elected, which I had, I had said in The Guardian is likely, you know, I was one of the very, very few people saying this. My pundit card got canceled. You know, <laughs> I still don't really understand the mechanics of that. You would think that people would want to know how I guessed that or want to know why I thought that. Yeah. Uh, and instead, the, the response was, we just don't want to hear from you anymore. Back during the Bush era, when he wrote books that mainly critiqued the Republicans with work such as What's the Matter with Kansas, The Wrecking Crew and Pity the Billionaire, Thomas Frank was the toast of the liberal media. Frank regularly appeared on MSNBC, NPR and Real Time with Bill Maher. But when he focused his writing on the competence of the Democrats, with work such as Listen Liberal or Whatever Happened to the Party of the People, the media started to ignore him. Even though his critiques were coming from a left-wing perspective, Frank was no longer featured in these liberal programs. Like, my writing is still very popular in, I mean, I don't do journalism anymore, but uh, up until when I quit, my writing was still very popular in England, in France, uh, in Germany, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Uh, it's only in America that that basically uh, people just do not want to hear what I'm talking about, which is peculiar because this is the home country of populism, right? This is yeah. where the word comes from. This is where the idea comes from. It's very strange that we are the country that 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 does not want to hear about what I'm ta what we're talking about. Most modern day liberals have cast populism as a disease that needs to be eradicated. But Frank is one of the few who understands that populism is in fact the cure for the ills of our democracy. But first, before we go over its merits and strengths, we first need to define populism. I am from. Kansas. Kansas was ground zero of the populist revolt in the 1890s. We call it a revolt. It wasn't really a, like an armed revolt or anything. It's a revolt against the two-party system. Uh, uh, and populism was a third-party movement, left-wing third-party movement of farmers and workers. It's a sort of classic farmer labor party. Okay. So this was, you know, uh, a movement of working class people demanding that the government uh, legislate on and rule on their behalf rather than on behalf of the banks, you know, the industrialists, that kind of thing. It was all had all the elements that we think of as a classic, you know, left wing movement. That's what it was. It was, uh, you know, there's, you know, labor parties and socialist parties uh, cropping up all around the world at that time in the 1890s. And this was the American version of it. The word populism originated on May 28, 1891 when the American nonconformist and Kansas Industrial Liberator, a radical newspaper out of Kansas, described members of the People's Party as populists as a convenient shorthand. The People's Party, the original populists, declared itself to be the first great labor conference of the United States and of the world, bringing together the producers of the nation to oppose the capitalist corporation's national banks. Its party platform in 1892 stated, we believe that the powers of government, in other words, of the people, should be expanded as rapidly and as far as good sense of an intelligent people and the teachings of experience shall justify, to the end of that oppression, injustice, and poverty shall eventually cease in the land. One of the core policy proposals that the populace advocated at the time was getting the U.S. currency off of the gold standard, which had caused massive deflation and limited the number of dollars in circulation. Debtors, mostly farmers, went bankrupt as they had to repay the banks with dollars that were more valuable than they had been before they took out their loans. The gold standard was the key issue during the 1896 presidential election. Although the populists ran their own candidate four years prior, in 1896, they decided to back the Democratic nominee Williams Jennings Bryan, who promised to move the U.S. monetary policy to a silver standard. Unlike gold, which is scarce, silver is more widespread and as a standard would have increased the number of dollars in circulation. However, in the presidential election of 1896, the banks and the so-called captains of industry all lined up behind Bryan's Republican opponent, William McKinley, to crush the populist revolt. As a gifted orator, Bryan ran an energetic campaign giving speeches across the country. 
McKinley, on the other hand, ran a front porch campaign, staying at his home in Canton, Ohio, from which he poured massive financial resources into propaganda against Bryan, essentially buying his way to the White House. Adjusted for inflation, McKinley's 1896 presidential run was, and still remains, the most expensive political campaign in American history. It could be argued that, with Bryan's defeat, the populace lost the battle, but they would go on to win the war. Years later, and after the eventual collapse of the People's Party itself, the core demand of the populace to replace the gold standard was achieved under FDR and the adoption of a flat currency. Elsewhere, we find other demands of the populace becoming U.S. policy. These included the direct election of U.S. senators, who used to be chosen in the state legislatures, regulation of the railroads, women's right to vote, an income tax for the rich, and jobs for the unemployed. Thomas Frank, in his more recent book, The People Know, A Brief History of Anti-Populism, emphasizes that it is inherently a democratic, left-wing, working-class movement. Populism is the American way of waging class warfare. It is important to clarify this definition of populism, since in recent years, mainstream pundits have completely misconstructed the war to fit their own agenda. And then here very recently, you have this, um, you know, the uh, political scientists, particularly European political scientists, who have decided that the word actually refers to like proto-fascist demagogues. And we can talk about why, how they came to decide that. That's another really interesting question, how, how their like crazy redefinition of populism got started. But they've basically for whatever, and I, I still don't know how this part of the story happened they have taken their definition their redefinition of populism has basically driven out uh the old you know american classic definition of the word uh and it, to, to the point where now it's just uh it's just standard to refer to people like donald trump and uh, marine le pen and you know these these sort of dreadful right-wing characters as uh as populists you see this all the time among the many faulty definitions of populism, we see a prevailing tendency to characterize it as a nativist movement opposed to all things foreign. For instance, William Galston of the Brookings Institution describes populism as protectionist in the broad sense of the term and against foreign goods, foreign immigrants, and foreign ideas. Hoover Institution historian Yao Ferguson agrees and argues that populism is always a backlash against globalization. But this definition doesn't tally with the historical origins and development of populism. After all, Williams Jennings Bryan also ran on a free trade platform. Far from opposing foreign trade, farmers, who comprised the largest faction of the populace, naturally wanted to increase exports on their goods. This positive attitude towards trade was in sharp contrast to Bryan's Republican opponent, who infamously passed the McKinley Tariff to protect industrialists from international competition. Linked to the notion that populism is protectionist is the equally mistaken idea that it is inherently nativist. In the Los Angeles Times, Jonah Goldberg identifies Donald Trump as a nativist whose one core issue is stopping illegal immigration, and in this stance, he resembles some of the great populists of yesteryear, according to Goldberg. CNN's Fareed Zakaria agrees and argues that the real democratic populists of the late 19th century were anti-immigrant activists. But these pundits have it completely backward, as Frank explains. When you, you know, and the populace did have in their, I think in their platform in 1892 or whatever, they, they, they wanted, um, they wanted to end what they called pauper immigration. But you have to compare it to like, were they, were they more anti-immigrant than the Republicans and the Democrats? And the fact is, those other two parties also said the same thing in their platform. All three of them said it. So it's like, how, you, it, there's no way you can single them out for that. And at the same time, even as though they said that in their platform, which they said um, because they were trying to bring the Knights of Labor on, and they did, the Knights of Labor became part of the populist coalition. Um, uh, uh, their, the candidate that they nominated, who was this uh, Civil War general from Iowa, 
um, what was his name? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. blanking on his name. Uh, Weaver was his name, Weaver, James right. Weaver. So Weaver then went around the proceeded to go, or, you know, he got the nomination of the Populist Party and went on this, you know, na national tour giving speeches and was constantly talking about we needed open immigration in America. He was constantly talking about it. Uh, you know, he was like, we've got to be the this this haven for refugees from other countries, from the industrial systems of Europe and from feudalism and all that. It's like, um, so there you go. That's that's populism. There's a famous book written on this very subject called The Tolerant Populists. And it was about about like immigrant group. The guy does a, it was written in the 60s. And the author does this granular uh, uh, interpretation of, of elections in Kansas where the populists were strong and who voted for whom. And the populists were very strong with all the recent immigrant groups. The uh, There was an anti-immigrant group at the time like a hate group like a like a clan kind of group they were called the american they weren't called populists they were called the american protective association and they were you know deeply anti-catholic all the rest of it they were republicans and the the populists hated them unlike quote unquote right wing populism which frank likes to call fake populism real populism has nothing to do with protectionism and xenophobia Referring to how the media have labeled demagogues like Donald Trump, Viktor Orban, and Recep Tayyip Erdogan as populists, Frank notes the risks this poses for those who would try to defeat them. It actually does damage to the sort of uh, the 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 only tradition that might defeat people like Donald Trump. You know, which is you know, if you if you're really interested in beating the right, then you might. You know, you might want to look into what populism actually was and what the actual populist tradition was, because that's the only way you're ever going to do it, in my opinion. If populism is, as Frank maintains, the only way for the American left to win, the next question becomes, how does populism work? And why should the American left re-embrace this radical tradition? Never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. Also received the strong endorsement of Mayor Rahm Emanuel. So let me say, let me say, let, let me say. I want to thank Rahm Emanuel for not endorsing me. I don't want his endorsement. To recreate their winning formula, Democrats only need to look back at the time of the New Deal when the party swept the entire country. Yet, one of the biggest myths in recent political discourse, and one that hinders that effort, is the notion that FDR was in no way a populist. Historian Sean Willens argues that, in everything that mattered, Roosevelt and the New Deal coalition repudiated populism. Willens bases his argument on the fact that FDR famously brought a brain trust of academics into his cabinet, and this embrace of intellectuals apparently disqualifies FDR as a genuine populist. Here we find another stigma that modern conceptions attribute to populism, that it is against knowledge itself. Various pundits believe populism to be some kind of moronic cult. David Brooks of the New York Times writes that populism is against intellectual excellence and celebrates the quick slogan, impulsive slash, and easy ignorant assertion. Tom Nichols of The Atlantic, in a book titled The Death of Expertise, colorfully calls populism a celebration of ignorance. Jonathan Roch echoes these sentiments in the Washington Post, arguing that the populist elite bashing tenor of our times denigrates the great value that professionals and experts offer. Now, Roosevelt did have his brain trust, 
but the quote-unquote experts of society were overall against him. Uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt did not have the great economists of his day uh, on board. That's like... Uh, that is a really easy thing to refute. The great economists of the of the period were, as I point out in the people know, were profoundly on the side of Herbert Hoover and the Republican Party. I mean, profoundly aligned with Herbert Hoover and the Republican Party. Roosevelt's uh, supporters came from the fringes of academia. It was not like the weight of orthodoxy was behind him. We think that now. It's an illusion. We think that now because... The, the people that, you know, the, the liberals have conquered the academy, um, but uh, that was not the case in the 1930s at all, not even close. Roosevelt himself even joked that if the ballot of the United States were limited to the holders of college degrees, the country would probably last about two years. He also wasn't entirely exaggerating when he said, never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as it was not just the majority of intelligentsia that was against him. Historian Arthur Schlesinger also estimated that even 75% of the country's biggest newspapers also opposed FDR. But it was the very scorn from the media, the disapproval from the intelligentsia, and the ridicule from the establishment that made FDR more appealing. Most Americans are generally skeptical of authority, and nothing makes a candidate more credible with the electorate than the universal ire of the elites. This is because a plurality, or perhaps a majority, of Americans are what political scientists Lawrence Jacobs and Benjamin Page describe as conservative egalitarians. They are conservative in the sense that they don't trust the government or public officials, but at the same time, they are egalitarian in that they generally care about addressing inequality and poverty. Conservative egalitarianism explains how individual Americans often appear to hold inconsistent, sometimes contradictory views. For instance, when polled, Republicans generally say they are against welfare programs. This is because when people often think of the concept of welfare, they imagine wasteful spending from a government they don't trust. But when pollsters name specifics, like food stamps or unemployment benefits, the majority of Republicans say they don't want those programs cut. This recalls how, 10 years ago, many Americans voiced support for the Affordable Care Act while simultaneously saying they don't support Obamacare, even though they are the same exact thing. Coming up with a consistent formula to win over an electorate with such contradicting views may seem impossible. But populists can win if we understand the electorate as being conservative egalitarians. On one hand, populists can harness hatred from the media and academic elites in order to appeal to the conservative instincts of many Americans. At the same time, they can promote popular policies that reduce inequality in order to appeal to their egalitarian side. Another aspect of populism that appeals to conservative egalitarians is the sense of patriotism. Just as conservatives often express strong love for their country, populists also embrace Americanism to their own advantage. The original populists did so as well, with their own form of inclusive nationalism. Take, for instance, the old CIO union that catapulted FDR into the White House. It was essentially the only national organization to provide Roosevelt with tens of thousands of campaigners. But the CIO also helped FDR free the party from the dominance of Dixiecrats and isolationists in order to create what historian Michael Denning called pan-ethnic Americanism, which he defined as pride in ethnic heritage and identity combined with an assertive Americanism. Denning writes that pan-ethnic Americanism was perhaps the most powerful working-class ideology of the age of the CIO and it significantly reshaped the contours of official U.S. nationalism. The CIO was quite disciplined in demanding this sort of tolerant nationalism within its ranks. The publicity director of the union during the New Deal era, Linda Cox, wrote, there is no room for baiting of any minority group or nationality or race in the CIO. We are against all forms of red baiting, of Jew baiting, of Catholic baiting, of alienating. The CIO also asserted pan-ethnic Americanism in their campaign literature. In their 1944 pamphlet titled, This is Your America, it writes, If you are a worker, earning your living honestly, if you are a farmer, a small businessman, or a housewife, if you are against all people who think only of themselves and never of other people, if you have faith in America as a good place to live in for the common people, 
America belongs as much as to you as to any other citizen. Today, it is a difficult task for American leftists to love a country that was founded by slave owners. But there are American traditions that the left can proudly embrace. After all, the Civil War, which was fought to preserve the Union and led to the abolishment of slavery, was a left-wing war. Unlike their southern counterparts, the Union Army consisted of many newly arrived working-class immigrants that fought for an America they can be proud of. Even radicals at the time viewed the preservation of the Union in the Civil War as a left-wing cause. In January 1865, Karl Marx wrote to Abraham Lincoln to congratulate the American people upon your re-election and to reassure the president that the working men of Europe feel sure that as the American War of Independence initiated a new era of ascendancy for the middle class, so the American anti-slavery war will do for the working class. In response, U.S. Ambassador Charles Francis Adams wrote back on Lincoln's behalf, saying that the president had an anxious desire that he may be able to prove himself not unworthy of the confidence which had been recently extended to him by his fellow citizens and by so many friends of humanity and progress throughout the world. It matters little if the founders of America were hypocritical in their struggle to create a country where all men are created equal. What matters is that there were American leftists throughout history who sought to make that statement true. There have been some efforts in recent years for the left to reclaim America. We see this in proposals to make Juneteenth a holiday comparable to the 4th of July. But for the most part, the left has abandoned patriotism and Americanism altogether. It is quite ironic that the right and the traitors that once waved the Confederate flag have now stolen the stars and stripes from the left. The Democratic Party has has not been able to rise to the challenge. While while apparently having this incredible power over, uh, you know, over everything, right? Because liberals are, you know, academia is liberal. Wall Street is liberal. The CIA apparently is liberal now, you know, the, <laughs> and yet, and yet they can't, they can't beat these guys. You know, what the hell? Wait, have you what seen the hell, that? James? <laughs> Sorry, this isn't my question, but you mentioned the CIA. Uh, have you ever seen that woke CIA? Oh, yeah, yes. The, yeah, the yeah, commercial. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a woman of color. I am a mom. I am a cisgender millennial who's been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. I am intersectional, but my existence is not a box checking exercise. I am a walking declaration, a woman whose inflection does not rise at the end of her sentences, suggesting that a question has been asked. I used to struggle with imposter syndrome, but at 36, I refuse to internalize misguided patriarchal ideas of what a woman can or should be. My parents left everything they knew and loved to expose me to opportunities they never had. Because of them, I stand here today a proud first-generation Latina and officer at CIA. That I was at, you know what South by Southwest is? Yes, of course. It's annual festival. So I, I, I went, I went to it in March. And the CIA had a had a booth there in the exhibition hall. And I went up and was like talking to them about it's like, what are you guys doing here? You know? And uh, uh anyhow, it was it was bizarre, it was mind-blowing, and they were just one part of the you know, the whole um uh, intelligence community had this big presence at South by Southwest. I guess they were there for the punk rock, right? Rather than trying to win over the working class and embracing pan-ethnic Americanism, the modern left has gone the opposite route. The liberals in particular are no longer even antagonistic to the ruling class. They have started to embrace the very elites they used to oppose. During Barack Obama's second term, the president attempted to pass the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which critics called NAFTA on steroids. All the major unions begged him not to go ahead with the TPP, as the trade deal included investment protections to limit the costs of offshoring manufacturing jobs to sweatshops overseas. Environmental groups also pressured Obama to pull out of the TPP, as it would have dramatically increased fracking. Even Doctors Without Borders came out against the TPP, because it would have increased patents and costs of drugs they needed. But as president, who attacked Hillary Clinton on NAFTA during the 2008 campaign, was not moved. Obama had a new constituency, one that was made up of Wall Street banks and Silicon Valley elites, and they wanted the TPP passed. Yes, 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 and that's part of the TPP. That's right, and I I had written about this many times, the trade agreement, I mean, as we all know, and the AFL-CIO, of course, and 
we, you know, uh, that that these aren't free trade agreements because they always they actually protect um, pharmaceutical patents. They're actually protectionist for big pharma. Um, you know, so calling it free trade is a misnomer. Yes, of course. But it is not just Obama or the Democratic Party leadership that has catered to the elites. Even leading liberal activists have aligned themselves with the modern day counterparts of the robber barons. Take, for instance, the Human Rights Campaign, one of the leading LGBTQ rights advocacy groups in the US. In 2017, the HRC awarded the founder of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, with the Equality Award. The billionaire was recognized for being one of the largest financial backers of the fight for marriage equality, and he was also praised for airing Transparent on Amazon Prime, a show about a transgender parent. Now, I probably don't need to point out how beyond ludicrous it is to give an equality award to the wealthiest man in the world, nor is it necessary to raise legitimate questions about his commitments to LGBTQ rights. The point I want to make is that liberal advocates, who are often outspoken on the topic of intersectionality, are at the same time frequently unwilling to extend the same inclusivity to working people. Take Robin D'Angelo, the author of White Fragility, a book that became the number one New York Times bestseller during the George Floyd uprising in the summer of 2020. D'Angelo does not see identity and class politics going hand in hand. To her, it is an either-or situation. When someone says it is about class, that tends to function as a way to get race off the table, D'Angelo said. Even the scholar who coined the phrase intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw, does not seem to include class politics as an essential component of the intersectional agenda. Crenshaw writes that, Class cannot help you see the specific contours of race disparity. Perhaps not. But it could also be argued that her so-called expertise on racism does not allow her to see the specific contours of class disparity. She is completely blind to the plight of working people as she has cozied up to big corporations who happily shell out fifty to $100,000 per session to lecture workers on how they need to be more politically correct. Right after the 2020 Democratic presidential primary and during the George Floyd uprising, Crenshaw said that, You basically have a moment where every corporation worth its salt is saying something about structural racism and anti-blackness, and that stuff is even outdistancing what candidates in the Democratic Party were actually saying. Apparently, when a presidential candidate like Bernie Sanders proposes universal health care and eliminating student debt, it is not as progressive as the union-busting Starbucks putting Black Lives Matter on their coffee cups. There is nothing inherently wrong with Democrats embracing identity politics. But what's the point if it is not inclusive of class politics? Why can't the liberals, like the New Dealers and the old CIO, find pride in the identity of being a working class person? An illuminating example of this is Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren's embarrassing incident in 2018. Warren has an impressive background. She grew up working class in Oklahoma, She was a Reagan Republican in the 1980s, but she switched to Democrat after witnessing how banks bankrupted working families. She had a relatable story, and everybody loves a redemption arc. But what did she do when Donald Trump made fun of her and called her Pocahontas? She took a DNA test to prove that she is technically Native American. Apparently, it was through the inherited drops of blood that she could feel self-worth, and not from the sweat on her brow from her life as a working mom. Warren could have easily shut down Trump by saying she was proud of her identity as a working class woman, unlike the president who was fed with a silver spoon. But in this day and age, there is no longer honor in class identity. So, Warren felt the need to prove she was also a racial minority, rather than just honestly telling her compelling life story. She has even concealed her past as a Republican as if it's a source of shame, when it could have been an asset for her presidential run to demonstrate how she can win over people on the other side. So what happens when Democrats take away any sense of pride from the working class? The vacuum is filled by fake populists like Donald Trump, Senators J.D. Vance, and Josh Hawley. None of these demagogues have any interest in passing pro-labor laws, like mandatory paid leave or increasing collective bargaining rights. But because the Democrats have been so incompetent, fake populists can win elections just by acting the part without doing anything substantial for the material needs of working people. Liberalism is turning away from the working class as an 
you know, an agent of reform. And this is, by the way, it goes back to populism, right? The populists were the first ones to say the working class, in America anyways, the working class is where reforms come from. And in the late 1960s, the intellectuals of America were saying, no, that's not right. Uh, the, the leadership of the left should be students. So this is, a, this is a pretty momentous change. At the very same time, the Republican Party, under the leadership of, of one Richard M. Nixon, is figuring out that they can reach out to uh, white working class voters and bring them over to the, into the Republican fold. And uh, they did it. Uh, Nixon openly campaigned with this kind of message um, and was fairly successful at it. Uh, Ronald Reagan deliberately mimicked the Franklin Roosevelt, I mean, deliberately, because Roosevelt was the hero of his youth. He had come up as a new dealer and had been a, a union union president uh, and uh, deliberately mimicked Roosevelt's style, uh, used Roosevelt's phrases. What was the, the famous one that's always attributed to Reagan, but in fact, he stole it from Roosevelt. It's, he says, this generation has a rendezvous with destiny. And he, he swiped that from Roosevelt, but it's always attributed to Reagan. In 1984, he actually got Roosevelt's old campaign train out of mothballs and toured the, toured the Midwest on Roosevelt's old train. They did all of these things to try to uh, steal the populist, um, uh, what would you call it, the populist spirit of the Democratic Party and, and were successful at it. But that doesn't make him a populist. The things that Reagan actually did, I mean, Reagan destroyed the power of labor in America. You know, he deregulated, uh, uh, enshrined Wall Street as the, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of the people who made financial policy in this country. These are all very anti-populist. He even dreamed about bringing back the gold standard. These are all profoundly anti-populist things. But he, he sold it with a smile and with the um, rhetoric of the Roosevelt days, which is fascinating. It's a fascinating political move, and it looks like populism, but it isn't, right? While the center-left liberals have abandoned the working class, there are others on the further end of the left-wing spectrum particularly the new wave of socialists, who do focus on class politics. However, the problem with this group differs from their liberal counterparts. While they do not awkwardly embrace the elites like liberals, they have abandoned Americanism to the right. As civil rights activist Julius Lester wrote, American radicals are perhaps the first radicals anywhere who sought to make a revolution in the country which they hate. And it's like it's like good luck with that, right? <laughs> you're, you're gonna, and that's he's. I, I I assume he said that in like the late '60s, early '70s. Yeah, yeah. that's because uh, he's talking about like the Weathermen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, SDS, which went from being very patriotic and you know uh, a sort of uh, 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 you know idealistic young left wingers to being you know spelling America with a K. You yeah. know they did this and. Uh, uh, you know, denouncing America constantly. Uh, and it's like, yeah, that's going to work. You're going to be able to sell that one, you know? And yeah. no, they, but of course the weathermen had like, given up on trying to appeal to the American people. They regarded that as futile. The thing to do was to fight the American people. This trend with the new left six decades ago continues today. In the 2016 presidential election, for instance, there were three slogans from the right center-left, and far-left. On the right, you had Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again. On the center-left, Hillary Clinton said, America is already great. And on the further end of the left-wing spectrum, you had radicals carrying protest signs reading, America was never great. Never mind which is true, as there is no objective metric to measure a country's greatness. Just ask yourself, which of these three slogans is more winnable? Clinton's slogan signals a continuation of the status quo when every working class person is struggling and is demanding change. And leftists are basically insulting the majority of Americans who generally continue to take pride in their country. Is it any wonder that Trump's slogan proved to be the winning campaign message? There was a brief moment not too long ago when socialists and progressives did have a winning message. In 2011, the Occupy Wall Street movement captivated the country with the slogan, We are the 99%. It was brilliant, as every working person in America could understand exactly what it meant. 
But that slogan is now a relic of the past. Try going to a protest today and chant that message. It won't catch on. Because since Trump's victory in 2016, one half of America thinks the other half is racist, sexist, and irredeemable. Even when it has virtually majority support on all major policy positions, the left became defeatist. I think we also have to understand something. I mean, literally, every, everything in our society and culture is aligned against Republicans. It's a miracle Republicans win anywhere. Every, virtually every major television and media outlet in America is against us, all the celebrities, all the uh, movie uh, actors. I mean, you name it. I'm going to end today's episode by using a very personal example. So I grew up in a fairly left-wing household. I've always been a leftist. But I have a close aunt who I love, but I don't want a name to keep her privacy. Uh, who's a staunch Republican and is also chair of a local Republican club in upstate New York. Anyway, my aunt uh, also ran a small business during the financial crash of 2008. She employed few people at the time, and she was forced to let go of one employee or she wouldn't make a profit or, you know, her business wouldn't survive during the recession. Anyway, instead of firing anyone, she decided as the boss... She, she just would, wouldn't, wouldn't take a paycheck for over a year. She, you know, everyone else got a paycheck, but she decided as the boss, she was going to work for free. In other words, my aunt, the staunch Republican, she understood the concept of labor solidarity. She understood that no one should be out of the job just because of the whims of the marketplace, to the point that she was going to sacrifice a whole year's pay. So, I don't ask myself why my aunt is a Republican. What I do ask myself is, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with the left? Why can't we win her over? Why can't we win over someone who clearly understands and shows compassion for the plight of the worker? Hillary Clinton may lump my aunt with the basket of deplorables, and liberal pundits like the Slate columnist Jamel Bowie may declare that there's no such thing as a good Trump voter. And sure, not every Republican is on board with us when it comes to the culture war issues, but the problem with the modern left is that it lacks what civil rights historian Lawrence Goodwin called ideological patience. To build a movement like the People's Party of the 1890s or the labor movement of the 1930s, one must connect with people as they are in society, that is to say, in a state that sophisticated modern observers are inclined to regard as one of inadequate consciousness. Goodwin also warned against the politics of individual righteousness, a tendency towards celebrating the purity of one so-called radicalism. If you wish to democratize the country's economic structure, he argued, you must practice ideological patience a suspension of moral judgment of ordinary Americans. Only then can you start to build a movement that is hopeful and powerful and that changes society forever. Populists understand ideological patience. While drawing ire from the top 1%, they welcome the working class to their ranks. They are willing to look past certain faults to see the good that the vast majority of people share. We might be offended by some of the positions many working class people have on culture war issues, but as Malcolm X once said, don't be in a hurry to condemn because he doesn't do what you do or think as you think or as fast. There was a time when you didn't know what you know today. I have spoken extensively on how the modern American left can recreate a populist movement by looking at the original People's Party in the late 19th century or the New Deal during FDR. But if we are to recreate a populist movement that fits our time when we must also address racial and gender-based injustice, perhaps our best influence can be the civil rights movement. Nowadays, uh, uh, they think they know about the civil rights movement, right? Because it's, you know, we we talk about it all the time, but they don't. They don't know the details. They don't know how it actually played out. You know, that it was a very, an extremely populist movement that relied on uh, actual individual citizens, not like highly educated people in Washington, D.C., but it mobilized ordinary black citizens of America in the South to go out and protest and demand their right to vote and, and succeeded 
from the bottom up. It was an amazing inspirational story. People don't know this. They, of course, in the late 60s, everything went wrong for them. But at their height, when they were organizing voters in the South, this was a very populist movement. You know, it was very similar to the original populist party, or, you know, the farmers movement back in the in the 1890s. And people at the time, you know, pointed this out. King himself talked about the populists. Martin Luther King did speak about populism, and in 1965, after witnessing King announce the movement was going beyond civil rights and towards the fight for economic justice, Michael Harrington in the New York Herald Tribune observed that they seek a new populism. But it is not just with MLK where we can find inspiration. In a previous video I made on the five underrated civil rights leaders, I spoke about civil rights leader Fannie Lou Hamer. If there is a quintessential populist that the modern left today should emulate, it was her. In 1964, Fannie Lou Hamer ran for Congress against the staunch segregationist incumbent Representative Jamie Witten in the Democratic primary. Hamer knew she had no chance of winning, as her race for office was mainly a vehicle to encourage black Mississippians to register. And yet, Hamer still took the opportunity to try to win over poor whites. While still significantly better off than black Mississippians, she understood that Jamie Witten has got the whites thinking they're doing real well because more money is spent on their children than on Negroes. With job losses and underfunded education impacting people of both races, Hamer said that even the white children are getting the short end of the stick. Fannie Lou Hamer was a sharecropper in the most racist state in the country where she had been tortured at the hands of whites. She was evicted and fired from her job for merely trying to register to vote. She survived assassination attempts by the KKK. Throughout her whole life, whites never treated her with any respect. No one could have blamed Fannie Lou Hamer if she had decided to simply hate all white people. And yet, Hamer always believed in the eventual goodness of humanity. She told her supporters that, we are not fighting against these people because we hate them, but we are fighting these people because we love them and we're the only thing that can save them now. We are fighting to save these people from their hate and from all the things that would be so bad against them. It takes a lot of ideological patience to be willing to say you love a people that treated you as if you are not even worthy of the right to vote. But that is exactly the kind of discipline that the modern left needs in order to win over those white working class voters that may have voted for a racist, sexist candidate like Donald Trump. But whether it is winning over the working class or people who may not agree with us on other social issues, it is our duty, on the left, to win. Whether it is climate change and its existential threat to the human species or the quarter of this country's population that doesn't have enough to eat, we do not have the latitude or the luxury to practice individual righteousness. As mentioned at the beginning, the right will always have more money. They will also have the police, the military, and all the institutional advantage against the left. But as even Karl Marx understood, we only win as leftists when we overwhelm the powers that be with the strengths of our numbers. We must practice ideological patience. We must wage class warfare by uniting the masses. The left needs to be home of the people.